Good morning and welcome to our COVID-19 briefing today on data modeling. I'm Robin Kaler, the Associate Chancellor for Public Affairs. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, again, our focus is on how the university is using data modeling to help both the state of Illinois and our university navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Quick reminder that next week we will have a briefing for faculty and staff on what you need to know to return to campus. You should get that invitation soon. It will also be at the same link as this one on the covid19.illinois.edu website. Our panelists today are Chancellor Robert Jones, Professor of Physics, Nigel Goldenfeld, Professor of Bioengineering, Sergey Maslov, and Epidemiologist at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, Awais Vade. Our format today will be some opening comments from the Chancellor, followed by a brief presentation by Nigel and Sergey, and then we'll take members of, uh, questions that you have submitted from members of the campus community. So Chancellor, would you like to get us started today? I think you're still muted. There we go. I think that's it. I think we can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but that's the age of technology. Uh, thank you, Robin, and thank you all uh, the panelists for sharing your time and your amazing expertise today to help us better understand how data and modeling is helping us navigate this pandemic, uh, both at the state and also at the local level. As you uh, uh, might have seen during the course of one of the governor's uh, uh, briefings, analytical and modeling efforts of both by Sergey and, uh, and, and, and uh, Nigel, Nigel have been critically important components of the decisions that our state has made thus far. It is very, very clear that throughout this crisis at the local and the state and national and global levels, one of the most difficult and I think one of the most uh, disconcerting things for uh, most of us is the lack of information uh, that we have about this virus. Uh, questions like how and when and where it might spread. And we know that when there are gaps in knowledge and gaps in data, our ability to make the best uh, and the most important decisions is dramatically diminished. So this is why we are so proud that our own researchers have been filling these gaps uh, with rapid, scientifically grounded, transparent, evidence-based information that gives our public health experts the vital tools that they need to maximize the safety of us all. And when we're speaking of pub about public health experts, uh, we are very fortunate to have some of the very best and most dedicated uh, these experts living right here in our Urbana Champaign community. The Champaign Urbana Public Health District has been working tirelessly long before the virus even reached this community to guide us all through this pandemic. Uh, Administrator Julie Pride and Deputy Administrator Awais Babe and their colleagues are the hardest working men and women in our community these days. And I just want to just take a moment to commend them for their service and for their dedication. So once again, thank you all for joining us for this briefing today and helping all of us understand a lot more about how data, how modeling is really giving us the critical edge, the critical tools that we need to understand and what is involved to return to in-person instruction this fall in ways that will maximize the safety of our students, our faculty and our staff, and critically importantly, our community as well. So with that, thank you all for being with us this uh, today and I'll turn things back over to Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And before we move to the questions, Nigel and Sergey, could one of you share your screen and just give us an overview of your modeling. And I know um, you're gonna answer a lot of the questions that we have in that, and we probably will ask you those questions again throughout. So thank you for your, uh, your patience on that. We know uh, there's just a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity about how this works. So if you could go ahead and share your screen, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, my, uh, I had to log in and log out, log out and log in. So could you allow the new uh, avatar to share my screen? So now it's a new Sergey Maslov on the, on the presentation. That is quite all right. We'll know it is not an imposter though, correct? <laughs> <laughs> yep, shouldn't be. All 
Okay. Thank you about sharing that. I have to say, I think we've experienced every possible challenge you could have with Zoom and the internet and one or more of these nine briefings we've had so far. So you are I have, I have part of the team. What we can do is we, we can let Nigel share his screen and then I will just tell him the next slide when, when it will be a time to. That sounds great. Right now I just cannot share, post disabled. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I will, I will start our presentation. And uh, I want to say that whatever we will present today uh, is actually uh, will be done on behalf of a group, a modeling group, which Nigel and I are co-leaders of this group. And uh, in addition to two of us, it involves two very talented graduate students, uh, actually it's four, now it's four, it, it grew since then. Uh, also, a Professor Ahmed Albana from Civil Engineering and student Zach Weiner, Tong Wang, George Wong, and Han Tao Zhang, and, uh, and a colleague, a physicist colleague from Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York, and Jiri Liu from Stanford University. Next slide, please. So the plan of the, today's brief presentation is that I will start giving you a snapshot of our projections for the state of Illinois, both uh, early projections we made for the first wave of the epidemic and the uh, uh, early signs of the second wave, which are very recent uh, data. And then uh, I will transfer uh, the microphone to Nigel, who will give you an overview of the SHIELD project, which is a project on how to safely reopen our university in the fall. And the conclusion, just to give you a spoiler, is that we believe that we can safely reopen the university given the testing and uh, uh, exposure notification uh, uh, work that will be and contact tracing work that we have on, on this campus. Uh, next slide, please. So a brief history. Uh, first, I will start with our background. Our uh, offices are next door to each other at the Institute for Genomic Biology, in fact, uh, Nigel is right now there, and I am at home. Uh, and we are both physicists. Our background is statistical physics, and statistical physics is the science of how to work with large uh, quantities of data and how to understand how large populations, large uh, collections of atoms or magnets or uh, anything large would self-organize to give some collective properties. And for the past 15, 20 years, we were working mostly on biological questions. We analyzed evolution, uh, ecosystems, mostly of organisms composed of viruses, bacteria, but also honeybees. Uh, so as such, we were completely in command of all the mathematical techniques used in modern epidemiology. And we were, very, we were able to very quickly uh, pivot our research, our regular research to COVID-19 modeling. So please cast your eyes, uh, you know, sort of mind's eye back to the middle of March when the epidemic, COVID-19 epidemic was just starting in, in Illinois. Next slide, please. And the only way that the testing was, the testing, the, 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 our testing capacity across the entire country were completely inadequate at the time. And the only way you can really predict uh, what is happening and, and see what is happening is through the uh, mathematical modeling. And that's exactly what we did. Even though the number of reported cases at the time in the middle of March was only uh, about 100, we could already predict the dramatic dynamics that a preemptive uh, mitigation steps such as stay at home, or home order, which was uh, instituted by our governor, uh, would have. So we uh, wrote this memo, and I want you to notice the date. So the date is March 18th. Uh, and we shared this memo with the governor. Uh, and in this memo, we kind of analyzed two scenarios in the state. They only differed from each other by how uh, early or how late the mitigation steps will be implemented. So we weren't able to exactly predict what the impact of the mitigation steps uh, would be in Illinois. In fact, at the time, we can only use the data from Wuhan and China uh, but we, we compared two scenarios. The blue line here is if the stay-at-home order 
would be implemented early on, pretty much we, we hope that it will be implemented uh, by April 1st. Uh, in fact, it was implemented even sooner. And in a red curve, uh, we, the, the same mitigation was delayed by two weeks, I believe. So it was um, um, uh, implemented a little bit more than two weeks. And I want to draw your attention that what is plotted on the y-axis here is the number of ICU beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. You see a very dramatic difference between the peaks and uh, the dashed line here corresponds to the uh, current capacity uh, for ICU beds in Chicago. We did this calculation for Chicago, first of all, because that's where the epidemic was really spreading the fastest uh, early on uh, in, in mid-March. And second of all, is because of our connections to several uh, doctors at several large hospitals in Chicago, we had access to the data and we were able to uh, to get the, 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 the relevant numbers about how many ICU beds are occupied uh, on any given day. So we were able to feed our model and we kind of, uh, this uh, memo was one of the contributing factors to convince our governor to do a very brave thing. He preemptively uh, uh, issued the stay at home order in our state on uh, March 20th, I believe. In fact, it was issued uh, one day sooner than New York, even though the epidemic in New York was much, uh, you, you know, started earlier. And, and as a result, the New York was in much worse shape at the time of the stay at home order is issued. So here are the real data about the deaths, not the ICU beds. Uh, and there are two, uh, two lines here. And I want you to guess which one is New York and which one is the state of Illinois. Well, you probably don't really need to guess hard to realize that the orange line is New York and the blue line is Illinois. This is a classical flatten the curve type of, uh, type of behavior, which we heard so much uh, from early on in the epidemic. And the Illinois successfully flattened the cur curve of the epidemic and as a result, avoided the overflow in hospitals and, and ICU bed capacity. I also want to make a quick plug in. This is uh, this visualization is done using the website uh, uh, by and the software by UIUC professor of computer science, Wade Fagin Umschneider. Uh, and uh, this is what we daily use, uh, Nigel, I and our group members daily use to visualize what happens not only in our state, but in any state or any country in the world. It's a very well executed website. So this is a brief timeline. I already told you about the events of March 18th and March 20th about our memo titled the window of opportunity and about the shelter in place order that was issued. Uh, now on uh, only a week later, after making a shelter in place order, the governor collected a group of modelers. In fact, uh, we were the founding members of this group of modelers. Uh, but right now, this group, in addition to us, includes uh, epidemiologists from the University of Chicago, Northwestern University, and Argonne National Laboratory. And we are using the data provided by the Illinois Department of Public Health. A good high quality data is essential for any modeling because the, the modeling is only as good as the data that is that is that you base your models on. And we are sort of fortunate to have access to really high quality data. In some sense, we have the access to all the, uh, you know, the information about the timing of all the COVID-19 cases in the state. Uh, when a particular case was hospitalized, when, when it was diagnosed, when, when the first symptoms onset happened and so on. And we continue working with IDPH and we are helped here by a, a, a company, a private company called Civis Analytics, which coordinates uh, uh, our access to the data and also provides us with the data usage agreement. Uh, so uh, our three university groups independently develop our models independently. And it's very important to have those independently developed models because we really don't have time right now to put our uh, preprints through peer review. We have to uh, give our advice to the state uh, rapidly and uh, we cannot really validate it using the standard channel, which we use as scientists, peer review and, and publishing in academic journals. So what we do instead is we compare predictions of models of three, actually four groups already. And this is sort of analogous to if you are uh, going to see a doctor and you have some really serious condition, you usually ask for a second or a third opinion before really committing to do something serious. Because what if the first doctor was wrong? And, you know, the doctors give different predictions, so are modelers. 
So this is an example of our model. Uh, there are three, actually four data streams which we are simultaneously fitting with our model. The purple one is the number of hospital beds occupied by the COVID-19 patients statewide. Orange is the number of ICU beds occupied. The blue line is uh, public data on daily death across the entire state, both in and out of the hospitals. And the green data is the daily death in hospitals, in ICUs to be precise. So all four, stims, uh, all four data streams are used to feed our model. And that's actually a, a, a unique, unique feature of our model compared to many other models on the market right now. And that gives us much higher confidence to spot trends early on. So this data I show you is actually a rather early data. This is May 7th. This is how the epidemic looked like back in early May. We were pretty much at the peak of the epidemic. We made certain predictions, and the question is, how did the predictions uh, actually work? So the short answer is that they worked rather well, but here is an important caveat. So whenever you're making a predictions using the epidemiology model, you cannot really predict uh, the actions by the state, and you cannot really predict how people will respond to any mitigation orders issued by the state. So there are a lot of caveats. So a lot of times when you predict something will happen and that the state will take your predictions into account and issues a, a proper uh, mitigation orders, your pre predictions will not come out to be right. So when, uh, when epidemiology predictions don't come to be correct, that's a good situation to be. So now let's transport forward in time, early July, July 1st to be precise when the second wave of the epidemic started and it actually already was going for several weeks in states like Texas, Arizona, and Florida. And we were very, uh, very worried about early signs, early uptick in hospital bed occupancy and the ICU occupancy, which we were able to spot in Illinois data. This is what I'm showing right now. Those red circles show this deviations from our previous predictions, which made us worried. Uh, and in fact, once we calibrated our data to this new model, we, we got completely different predictions. There is another important uh, point which we spotted using our high quality data. We realized that it's a lot of more young people are getting infected. This is sort of a breakdown of the uh, cases, infection cases by age. The red bars correspond to the first wave of the epidemic, roughly defined as the epidemic before June 1st. And the blue cases, the blue bars correspond to the second wave of the epidemic. And I want to draw to your attention this high, uh, high di large difference between the blue bars in categories under 21 and 21 to 30. So it is really clear from this plot that it's the young people that drive the second wave of the epidemic. Here's the data is shown for Southern Illinois, but it's reproduced in other areas of the state. So once we took our a new uptick into account, our model immediately predicted the emergence, uh, the start of the second wave. And as a result, we were predicting the peak in hospitalizations, ICUs, and deaths, which unfortunately uh, is comparable statewide to the peak we saw in the first wave. And this uptick was uh, triggered by the relaxation of the, some of the mitigation steps, stay at home order, and people also relaxing their inner guard, not doing social distancing enough. As, as we do with all of our uh, findings, you know, uh, serious findings, we write up a scientific preprint and post it on a public archive. This is a med archive preprint uh, containing our analysis of the second wave of the epidemic, both, both in Illinois and in other hard hit states such as Arizona, Florida, and Texas. And uh, you are probably interested in what is, uh, what is, what are our predictions right now. And fortunately, we just submitted our latest round of prediction. We do it weekly. And this is how we view the situation in the state right now. The situation statewide stabilized somewhat. Those upticks are still clearly visible. So our predictions completely panned out. Uh, our predictions about the severity of the second wave is a little bit lower than we did uh, uh, in July, on July 1st. Uh, so as you see the intensity of the waves. However, the bad news for us here in Urbana-Champaign in central Illinois is that those regions which were not really uh, hard hit by the first wave of the epidemic are, uh, so our first kind of wave, we only had about 100 uh, 100 hospital beds occupied, around 10 ICU patients, and 
blissfully only a handful of deaths per, per day, no more than two. But in a second wave, uh, if, if the, unless the trend will be modified, we predict a sort of a higher, more severe second wave than the first wave. The same holds for the southern super region, which uh, to a large extent is driven by the proximity to St. Louis. So a lot of the counties which are experiencing the second wave is driven by uh, people who are commuting back and forth between St. Louis and uh, Southern Illinois. So if you want to learn more about the modeling we do, please consult our uh, preprints on MedArchive. Some of them are already under review here. And the, the person, the paper on the right is the one where we study the effects of population heterogeneity. This has a really hard math and science. So if you're a math enthusiast, enthusiast please uh, take a look at this preprint. And now I will turn the microphone to Nigel, who will tell you about the university uh, uh, planning. Well, thank you, Sergey. And uh, I'm going to tell you about SHIELD, which I'm sure you've heard about in these series. So SHIELD is our idea for how we're going to safely reopen uh, the university in a, in a different but, uh, but uh, safe, uh, safe way. So SHIELD uh, has three parts, so it's target, test and tell. So target is, which is what I'm going to tell you about, is basically how do we test people, who do we test, and how can we calculate the overall effectiveness of the shield mitigation strategy that I'll tell you about. Now the core of our strategy is a new uh, test for COVID-19, and this is a saliva-based test. So it is, a, it is a much more pleasant test to do. I did one this morning. It took me three minutes to go in and dribble into a test tube and, uh, and be out on my way again. Uh, so it's very non-intrusive. It's very cheap. And most importantly, it has a very fast turnaround. You can get the results back in five or six hours in most cases. It's also very accurate and scalable. And because it's so fast, that means we have the ability to do uh, contact tracing and exposure notification, which is not normally the case with much slower tests. And uh, so that's the tell part of the shield, which is exposure notifications in partnership with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District and the Safer in Illinois uh, app and also uh, uh, OS app. So what do we do? Well, what we, we're trying to understand is who do we test? When do we test them? How often do we test them? What other mitigation strategies other than testing can be effective? And the bottom line is, can we reopen in a hybrid way and safely? So here's the answers and then I'll tell you how we get there. So who are we going to test? Well, basically everyone. Uh, and when are we going to test people? on arrival on campus, and that's very important, and then frequently throughout the semester. And how frequently? Well, what we discovered in, in doing our uh, modeling was that if we're going to do this in a safe way, we should do it uh, twice a week. And then finally, I'm going to show you that when you look at the synergistic combination of frequent testing, contact tracing, isolation, universal masks, restricting class size, app-based exposure notification, we can bring the epidemic to manageable and relatively safe levels for the students, the staff and faculty and our surrounding community. Now, of course, everything I'm going to show you here are, uh, are, are preliminary results. There's a lot of uncertainties in doing any kind of uh, computer modeling. And uh, we have tried, as I'll tell you, uh, many ways to, uh, to minimize those uncertainties and to try to make sure that our predictions uh, are, are at least semi-quantitatively and directionally uh, correct. So uh, why is this problem hard? Well, it's hard because we don't know the basic biology of how uh, COVID-19 is transmitted, although it's become very clear that this is due to droplets and aerosols in a much greater extent than was originally uh, recognized. We don't know how to model each intervention precisely. Uh, in other words, what happens when you put on a mask. Uh, the onset of the epidemic requires chance factors, and we have to take those into account. Uh, if we want to do exposure notification, uh, we have to understand how the infection process uh, occurs uh, and, uh, and how it is transmitted uh, and with respect to the, the proximity of students. How to measure the effectiveness of mitigations is, is something that is hard to do. And then, of course, the transmission models are very sensitive to many parameters and details. And we try to get around that by using multiple models and see if the results converge. And then lastly, of course, social life of students um, is not well documented and we make a worst case uh, scenario for that uh, in order to try to make sure that we know what's going on. Now, in principle, 
you could try to model this in two different ways. You could say, let's model everything. Let's build a computer model of every person in the university and every choice that they make, you know, what they have for breakfast and everything like that. Uh, but then, of course, you would have a huge number of adjustable parameters and your model would be very poorly constrained by data. On the other hand, you can try to do what we did with the state, where you model just the, uh, the population dynamics as a whole. But then you can't answer important detailed questions, such as what is the false positive rate of an exposure notification error. So what we do instead is we choose some kind of middle ground. What we have is a, is a sort of high level description of the model that goes something like this. If you look at a university, what is it? Well, it's a place where students and professors and, and teachers come together at specific times and places for classes. What we do is we took the uh, class schedule uh, for the fall 2019 semester, which is what we had available at the time. And there's about 45,000 students who are going to classes and, and, and uh, performing their activities. We have various zones, classrooms, bars, restaurants, dorms, coffee shops, libraries, other gathering places. And then what we did was we constructed the network of the students and these zones from this anonymized data. And this is what you get. Um, you see here, this is a representation of a social network where the nodes are the classes and the edges are the students. And most of you have heard of the sort of phrase six degrees of separation, uh, how many individuals are there between you and some other famous person perhaps. Uh, what we find with this university network is that it is a small world network. There's not six degrees of separation, there's about 2.5. And what that means is that information and uh, epidemics can spread very rapidly on that. So it's a very high transmission risk. And uh, then what we do now is that we take all those individuals, we simulate them going about their daily activities, and, uh, and, we, uh, and so this is called an agent-based uh, model. Now, an important part of this is that the, we have to understand how the transmission occurs. And the key factor, of course, is, uh, is uh, droplets and aerosols. And I'm not going to have time to go into all the details here, but what I want to point out is that if you are in a closed room and, and there's no masks or anything like that, you're emitting droplets uh, into the air of varying sizes. And just by breathing, you're doing that. By talking, you're doing that even more. By singing or shouting or lecturing, you're doing that even more than that. And we have to model that process and the physics of it is relatively well uh, understood. And then we have to model how uh, a student or an agent will uh, accumulate those, uh, uh, the, the virus that they get from these droplets and how the, the, those uh, viral particles can then lead to uh, an infection. So as I said, we, there's so many uncertainties in this that what we try to look for is convergence from different models. So we have different models, one which is a, a local model, which is perhaps more appropriate for when the transmission is due to touching or something like this, where you're, trans you're getting it from a surface that's been contaminated, um, or perhaps by being very close to somebody. And then there's a hybrid model, which we like the best, which also includes the background uh, aerosols and so on. And it's important because you've heard about the guidance about how to stand six feet away from people, and it's a very good guidance. But with aerosols, you actually need way more than that. The aerosols can really fill a room that is poorly ventilated. And this has been very well uh, documented. And then what we do is we calibrate our models to replicate what we've seen in the viral dynamics, particularly at the early stages of an epidemic where what the, the cases will double about every two and a half days. So what happens if we do nothing? Well, if we do nothing, this is what happens. So the way you read this graph is this is the number of people on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the time. And what you can see here in the red, this red curve is telling you how many people are infected at any given time. And what you can see is after about the three, third to fourth week, uh, pretty much everybody gets infected. And then uh, by this time, everybody has been infected. And so that's shown here and these people in green have, have recovered. So what happens now if we do testing? So this is what happens if we do uh, testing every week, which was the SHIELD original plan. And, and what happens is let's just follow the red curve. And now you can see that the number of people who get infected at any given time is much smaller, maybe about 15,000 as, as opposed to what it was 
um, what, it, what, it, what it was um, on this previous graph, where the top was, the maximum was about 40,000 or so. So testing really does make a difference. And it makes a difference because once you test somebody, you isolate them. And if you isolate them quickly enough, you stop them infecting other people. Now you test every three days, and now you see this number is even lower than 2,000, and it's been pushed out to 80 days. We've slowed down the epidemic, and we've flattened the curve just by doing testing. But there's more to that. Uh, we, and, and let me just tell you why this works very, very quickly. It works because of the way the infection works. There's a three-day latent period, and then there's a time period where you are infectious. And by doing the testing twice a week, we're much more guaranteed to catch people at their peak of infectiousness and therefore able to stop the uh, infection. Now, what you do once you've got those data is you have to do uh, contact tracing. And this is a complicated diagram. And what all I want you to know on this is this. This is how effective contact tracing is, the untraceable fraction. This is what is the delay if it takes a day or two days to notify the contacts. And the color scale is telling you how many people were infected during the semester. So lower is better. You want to have less people infected. And the only way contact tracing works is if you do it effectively and fast. And that's why our test is so important, because it is so fast. If we do digital exposure notification, we have the same thing. It's very fast because it's delivered through the internet, but is it effective? And what about the, the, the false positives? So here you are, a similar kind of diagram. This is a little bit more complicated. This is how many people are using the app and this is how sensitive the app is on this axis here. And the color scale is telling you how many people get infected during the semester. Again, lower is better. And what you can see happening is that if the app is going to be successful, uh, you have to have a very high adoption rate, perhaps above 60%. So it's very important for us that people use the app. And therefore, we have made a great deal of effort to ensure that the app will, if it gives you an exposure notification, you should take it seriously because there's a very high likelihood uh, that you uh, might in fact be uh, infected. So what happens when we do the full uh, uh, simulation? The structure of SHIELD is multiple layers. We have the state of Illinois government and the, and the local government testing in isolation. We're reducing the class size. In fact, only classes with under 50 people in person are allowed to be taught in person, even in principle. In fact, uh, some of those will not even be taught in, principle, in person, they'll be taught online. We have universal masking in university buildings and we require compliance with SHIELD uh, to enter university buildings. We have app-based exposure notification and we have strong incentives for the students to participate. And these mitigations act in a, in a non-linear way. So here's what happens if you do all of these things in a mitigation bundle. And you can see that the number of infections is now kept to below 100 at any given time. So it's very effective. This bulge that you see here, this jump in the number of infected agents shown at the beginning is due to what happens if students arrive back on campus and start to socialize without having first been tested and the and any infected people isolated. So it's very important that we have good hygiene uh, right after the start of the uh, semester. Uh, just, to, just to show you the effectiveness of the different mitigation steps, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but without mitigation, you have a lot of people infected. At the end of the day, uh, over the whole semester, you might get as many as four, 480 people in, in infected, but a, a huge reduction uh, and an increase in safety. I'm going to skip through these in the interest of time. Um, I do want to mention a few limitations. Uh, we've only modeled the students and professors in a, in a crude way. Uh, if we can't suppress the epidemic on campus, then we won't be able to uh, suppress it uh, in the population as a whole. But as you can see, we think we can uh, contain it. Um, we did not model the friendship social networks of the students when they go outside and socialize in bars and restaurants and so on and so forth. So our calculation is, in fact, a worst case scenario because we assume more mixing outside of the outside of the university. And so I think that's where I want to end. Uh, there's no single magic bullets to contain COVID-19 on campus, but a concerted suite of mitigation measures is effective in minimizing the risk to a level that can be contained uh, by uh, public health measures. And a hybrid campus reopening 
uh, seems doable. Uh, of course, we have to worry about the local prevalence, but we are lucky to be living in central Illinois where uh, we are in a good situation uh, with regard to that. And that's where I'll finish, thank you. Wow, that was great information. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, and I know, again, you've, you're, you've covered some of this in your talk, but I would like to go through it and make sure people didn't miss anything. Again, just overall, why is modeling important? Why do we do it? Maybe, I, I maybe I'll yes. start, we will do the alternate, and uh, Nigel and I will alternate the questions addressed to us. So the modeling is uh, the only way we can actually predict the future with, with some uncertainty. And uh, uh, the model also allows one to quantify the consequences of different mitigation steps and therefore to plan accordingly, the, the, the make the step pre making this future more optimistic than doing nothing. And, and of course, no prediction, no model is perfect. I already highlighted how uh, different limitations of models and, and we cannot really uh, model the human behavior very well, but, but that, that's in a nutshell why modeling is important. Great, thank you. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how you came to be experts assisting with the state of Illinois? We're all so proud of you for that. Sure, I'll take this one, Robin. Um, so Sergey already showed you a, a bit about the, the history of this. Um, but I, I would say that the, the, the way we, I don't know that we became experts. Uh, we, we don't consider ourselves as epidemiologists. We're not a replacement for them. There's certain aspects of, of this, of the modeling that we, that we are trained to do through our previous work uh, in uh, particularly in ecological modeling, uh, dynamical systems and, and statistical physics. And uh, because we work at the uh, Institute for Genomic Biology, uh, we are very uh, conscious of you know, viral uh, infections and so on. We've studied viruses and bacteria in our in our day to day work. And uh, as we saw what was happening throughout the world, uh, we became alarmed about uh, what would could potentially happen in the state of Illinois. And so we just took it upon ourselves to uh, start modeling this as a as a sort of part time uh, project very early on, which within uh, a couple of days, uh, our efforts doubled almost as fast as the virus uh, number of cases doubled. And, and so at this time, we're working 100% uh, on COVID-19 uh, and are called upon by the state and the university and, and other parties. And what are some of the specific things you're doing to support the state? Right. Uh, we are, uh, I already mentioned that we are uh, one of the four groups uh, advising the governor of Illinois uh, and making some modeling predictions. So every group uh, does weekly modeling predictions. We submit them on uh, Wednesday. Actually, we submitted our latest just yesterday, and those are the predictions I used in my slides. Uh, and we also advise the governor's office on, on multiple topics, just to give you an example, a couple of examples. Uh, early on, when the testing was scarce, they asked our advice about how many tests do we need, ideally, and if the testing is limited, which groups should be uh, sort of tested preferentially. A uh, more recent example is that when they are now thinking about the second wave and they are thinking about how, to, how they can predict in time uh, the hospitals in a particular area are likely to be uh, overflowing. So they need to have some uh, advanced warning about it if it's going to happen. And that's what modelers like us can, can advise. Great, thank you. And Robert, in addition to modeling, can you talk about how the university has been partnering with the state to meet the challenges of the COVID pandemic? Well, we have been partnering uh, with the state in many, many ways, Robin, and uh, to meet the challenges of, of COVID-19. And of course, uh, we take our guidance from the state and from the state health experts and uh, from the governor. Uh, but we also, I think, have acted as a model for other colleges and universities, uh, not only this fall, but in the spring. I remind you that we were one of the, well, the first university in the state to decide to move from face-to-face -to, -face to remote education and other institutions in the state also follow suit. And uh, we were one of the first institutions to start to frame what a safe uh, return to face-to-face -face instruction would look like uh, that has led to the modeling and some of the other innovations that I think most of you know about. It runs the gamut from during the uh, 
this whole process, our rapid vent technology that has provided the innovation that's necessary to assist hospitals that may have been in short, uh, have a shortage of uh, ventilators. We have also offered a number of educational and outreach programs in every county across the state to assist families and communities in dealing with the pandemic. And I think most of our viewers know about our very extensive uh, extension operation that has a presence of some form in almost in every county. And we've utilized that asset to get information out. And as we all know, during this pandemic, the ability to stay connected, the ability to uh, deliver remote education, whether you're a K through 12 or universities, have been very heavily dependent upon Wi-Fi hotspots. So we created a map of public uh, Wi-Fi hotspots across the state that we certainly hope has been beneficial. And ultimately, we supported the state by shaping and supporting and I think leading uh, education in the state, we educate more students uh, uh, than any other entity in the state. And we're very, very proud of that because these are the next generation of leaders who will help us recover not only from this pandemic, but prepare for the next and the next after that. So we continue to deliver a world-class education. But you know, I would be remiss if I also didn't highlight in addition to this amazing modeling work that Sergey and Nigel have been doing that really has, from my perspective, perhaps saved hundreds of lives. Our saliva-based testing, uh, the innovative saliva-based testing that Nigel uh, mentioned on the front end of his comments is innovative, it's novel. It is clearly nothing like it anywhere else in the country or the world, as far as we can tell in terms of its accuracy, its scalability, the cost and its potential impact. As Nigel showed, when you add that with the modeling scenarios, with the saliva-based testing and all the other things that we're requiring our students to do, we really do have the possibility of opening safely. And as most of our viewers, hopefully you heard this in the last few days, the governor has been very clear about being very excited about this testing capability and is currently looking to strategies that not only would make it available for the rest of higher education, but perhaps K through 12, uh, other kinds of public entities across the state. So I think uh, we have carried out our land grant mission in these very challenging times and very, very exciting ways because our land grant mission gives us the responsibility to serve the public good. And I can't think a better way that one serves the public good than the way that our faculty and staff, Nigel and Sergey and Marty and Paul and Tim and the whole team and their multidisciplinary approach that we brought to this pandemic that is certainly carrying out our land grant mission to serve the citizens of the state of Illinois and beyond. That's great, thank you very much. Uh, a waste. We've heard from people who say that because models change all the time, they can be misinterpreted, they, you can't trust them. Why should we trust models? Um, thank you. Um, I just before I answer that question, I want to reiterate again that we are so fortunate that we have the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and nowhere else. And I can also, you know, attest to the fact that our counterparts not just in Illinois, but across the nation are envious of what we have in our back, backyard out here. So that, that does give us an advantage of, of doing some good work that is recognized not just statewide, but nationally as well. So thank you for that. Um, yes, it is true that models change and it is also good that models change. And what, what that means is that the modeling team uh, that is working on the models are updating these models based on the most current scientific evidence and input from stakeholders. And as we learn more about the disease and its spread, we change and we adapt. And not just that, but we are also transparent in our reasoning on why we are doing it. The important thing also to keep in mind is that we are not just relying on models for decision-making. You know, a partnership between the modeling team, public health, and the local healthcare system gives us a better sense of 
how our community is dealing with what it is dealing with its challenges and we also modify according to real time practical information from the field great thank you and uh, back to Nigel and Sergey uh, i can't remember whose turn it is um, <laughs> Okay, great. There are uh, lots of groups engaged in modeling uh, the pandemic in Illinois, in the nation, around the world. How do all these different modeling efforts compare to one another and is there collaboration and how do we know which models to trust and why? So uh, some of the models uh, are quite different in their foundation. So our model, uh, we didn't get time to explain it in detail, but we literally follow the process of the epidemic. It's a mechanistic model, if you will, of the epidemic. Other models that people use are simply saying, well, the curve is going up like this, so we'll just predict what it, you know, project what it's going to do. And in fact, one very good example of that was a model that was uh, produced by uh, an institute um, in, uh, in, in, in Washington state, uh, which uh, gained a lot of national attention because they, their predictions were used by the White House, in fact. And, but their predictions were not based on sound uh, epidemiological principles, but were basically doing uh, a curve fitting. And so our predictions completely disagreed uh, with theirs and, and also other groups who were doing a similar style of modeling to us. And, and in fact, they eventually had to change their predictions um, and double them and, and, and their predictions now are similar uh, to ours. And the other thing that's different is as Sergey mentioned, uh, most other models sort of just calibrate to deaths or something like this. We calibrate to other streams of data, the hospital occupancy, the ICU occupancy, as well as deaths in and out of hospitals. And what that means is that we're, our models are able to make predictions uh, several weeks in advance of other models. And that's been important uh, in the state of Illinois, for example, and, and elsewhere. So the distinguishing feature of our modeling is that it's multi-channel. And that gives us a little bit of more extra, extra time to give policymakers time to react and decide what to do. So, Sergey, how often do you update your models? We are submitting our model predictions on a weekly basis uh, to Civis Analytics, which they then integrate the submissions by uh, four modeling groups and they present them to the governor's office. Uh, we also spend uh, literally at least three Day, three hours every day with our modeling group on conference calls where we discuss all the tweaks and uh, and uh, modifications we, we so we are updating uh, our models constantly not only based on the new data but also based on the new information which we get in scientific literature and elsewhere so for instance right now one of the priorities is to modify the model taking into account the different age structure of infected uh, people in the population. Uh, we also submit our models to uh, scientific preprint archives and some of our papers actually too are right now under review in different scientific journals. Not, not yet past uh, a full peer review, but I am confident they will. Thank you. And uh, Nigel, can you tell us about the models that you're creating specifically for our university community? I think those are fascinating. Thank you, yes. So, so the modeling that we're doing for the university is different from the modeling that we do for the state. Uh, first, first of all, because there's a much smaller number of people. It's 45,000 people who are the students registered for classes compared to 13 million in, in the state. And so it, there's a lot more randomness that comes in. And so we have to use a different type of modeling. But then what we are doing is we're trying to model the specific ways that we're thinking about mitigating uh, the spread of COVID-19 in our community. And, and because we're modeling at this individual level, uh, we can look at in precise detail at how these different steps uh, can uh, be effective and which ones are not effective and where are the danger zones. And so uh, we, we can see you know, what are the things that are the riskiest parts of, of our strategy. And, uh, and so our work has already uh, led to two different um, changes. One is we were testing uh, twice a week. Uh, that, that came from our modeling. And also we're working very closely with the, the team that is building the exposure notification app Safer in Illinois, uh, so that we can have a protocol that will be optimized for the, the effectiveness of that app. Thank you. And uh, Sergey, why is that University of Illinois community specific modeling important? Uh, well, we, we, we obviously uh, want to uh, 
have our community safe, but at the same time, the face-to-face -face instruction is, is very important for quality of education. That's why we are uh, working on, on, uh, on making the community safe while delivering face-to-face -face instructions. Uh, that, that's kind of in a nutshell, the answer to, to, to this question. Yeah, great, thank you. And, and Nigel, you touched on this, you both touched on this a little bit, but tell us again, where do you get the data that go into your models? Right, so the first thing I want to make sure, sure people understand is, as Sergey mentioned, we put, we, uh, put all our work um, on preprint archives, so there's complete transparency, but we also put our code on uh, public GitHub uh, repositories, so people can uh, can see you know what exactly what we're doing in detail and replicate it if they want to, but they won't be able to do that the way that we've been able to because you need uh, we're doing this multi-channel data as I mentioned earlier, and so we have to work with the Illinois Department of Public Health. So they've been fantastic in giving us access to very detailed data, not just hospital data, but lineless data and, and many other things. And, and that, has, that enables us to calibrate our models accurately. And at the same time, it enables us to then be a resource for them to answer their specific questions about, for example, uh, what is the probability that a hospital uh, is going to be uh, overflowing due to say a, a second wave or an outbreak. And so this partnership with the Illinois Department of Public Health is absolutely essential for us, uh, and, and we couldn't do our work without it. And a waste, obviously models are very important, but they are a piece of a larger puzzle. Can you talk about how individual compliance can really affect the outcome for our community? Sure. So, you know, indiv as individuals, we don't live in a bubble, right? And my actions as an individual has an impact on my family my friends, neighbors, my colleagues at work, and even strangers that I come across <clears throat> at a grocery store, at a restaurant, or other places in town as well. And the success for our community is completely dependent on compliance by individuals and also organizations, uh, small or large, I mean, as large as, as, as a campus as well. We need individuals to realize that while their actions may or may not have a direct impact on their own health, but it can have a catastrophic impact on others who may be coming in contact with, those who may have underlying health conditions or who have weak immune systems. And as a community, we can only succeed if everybody shares the burden and it should not fall upon a select few. And, and, and unfortunately, if we don't do this, then we will have to revert back to phase three or phase two of the stay at home order that we had to go through in March and April. And, and that is something we definitely do not want because we know how, how painful it was for a lot of people uh, for, for, for a long period of time. Yeah, and I mean, to me, it seems like the, the, all of these wonderful pieces, any one of them, uh, is a gift that's been given to our community. And it's like a little pile of gold, if you will. And I think we'd be really silly to fritter that away by saying, oh, somebody's taking care of this aspect, so now I don't have to do anything. Because it clearly all has to be a, a part of this whole puzzle. So Robert, can you talk a little bit about what we're doing to make sure that everybody's doing their part and that we get that full benefit that we talk about when we say shield? Uh, yes, Robin, um, as I've said and others have said, we really have taken every precaution that we can think of uh, to keep every member of our university community safe. And for us, it kind of starts with the fact that we've had to create this hybrid model of education where virtually every one of our courses will be offered in a format that it can be offered remotely or face to face. So we've essentially giving our students the option of taking their education this fall remotely or being face to face. And so if you decide that you want to come back and be a part of the university in person as a part of this hybrid model, then basically what we are saying to our students, that there's a certain type of behavior that we expect out of you that's fundamentally different than when you left way back in March. And uh, we expect there to be a certain type of behavior by, virtually, by virtue of your coming back that you're gonna be willing to abide by. And first and foremost, 
uh, based on the outstanding work of Nigel and Sergey. As you saw earlier, we made the decision as a requirement that there will be twice per week testing. Every three or four days, our students, faculty, and staff will be required to test. And there also, before, uh, in addition to the testing, we want to give people some kind of context uh, to understand why we are making these decisions and what's expected of them. So there will be mandatory training for every member of our community uh, if you are going to be part of the university this fall. And uh, in addition to the testing twice per week, as uh, uh, Nigel showed in his slide, if you combine that with the social distancing that we've done in the classroom, the social distancing that we expect uh, from all of our faculty, staff, and students while they're in class and moving between class, uh, anytime that they can't, um, you know, social distance themselves, uh, we expect them to wear masks under those situations at all times. And there's clearly the synergistic effects that Nigel showed where we, if we do all of these things and if we take responsibility, we can mitigate the spread of the disease and keep it at a level where we won't have a surge on our hospital system. We won't have a surge uh, in terms of our isolation spaces that we've set aside. And I have to add that we've been working very closely with local mayors and business owners as well, because the University of Illinois uh, may not be as porous as some urban campus, but we're not an island to ourselves. Our students live in the broader community. They shop, they go to establishments, uh, bars and restaurants. And I'm very, very pleased at the hard work and the partnerships that we develop with the local mayors and the business owners who are taking additional responsibility to help keep our university safe. And I can't emphasize enough the point that a waste made. Every one of us has to take responsibility for our own behavior. And if that's not sufficient, think about it in the context of the responsibility that we're taking for the other, whether that other is a friend or a colleague, somebody in your class, your grandmother, your parents, all of us have to take responsibility for doing the thing that's appropriate to control the spread of COVID-19 um, during this academic year and potentially beyond. Thank you. And Sergey, uh, I know we've talked a little bit about this, but I'd like to have it in one response. How has our modeling influenced the actual design of our on-campus COVID-19 testing program? Well, I'll, I'll take this one since it's a, a, shield, a shield question. OK, please. thanks, Nigel. That's OK. Um, so the, 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 the shield program has, ma has many different steps, but we don't really know how, how frequently to apply testing or which ones are most important and so on. So the specific things that I would point to right now are things like uh, the frequency with which we, uh, we do testing, um, the, uh, the idea that we need to have uh, mask wearing, the efficacy of having uh, small uh, in-person classes uh, only, um, the, uh, and then how does one design an exposure notification? The, the apps are designed to be privacy preserving, and that's a very important thing that we're doing here. I can't emphasize this enough. The apps do not track you. Uh, the apps uh, do not know where you are or even uh, who you are. The, the apps work uh, uh, in, in a different way from that. This has been cryptographically uh, designed. It's a very clever system. But what we were able to add to that was being able to put in information about the, the, uh, the epidemic dynamics into the app so that we can fine tune uh, how effective it is. And that's something that where you need to bring together people who know how to make apps, with people who know how to do uh, modeling and, and a smattering of epidemiology as we do. And so those are the ways that we've been working with the SHIELD team. And you mentioned the app. So for folks who are not familiar with that, it's uh, an app that was also developed by our own uh, faculty. And it allows uh, those who are on campus, who are faculty, staff, and students, to um, participate in the program, get notifications, uh, find out uh, if you can get into university facilities, if you've been cleared to get in. Um, and, and again, as, as Nigel said, uh, very, very uh, close and careful protection of privacy, which is, which is pretty exciting too, of course. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how our testing program differentiates us from other communities? Yes, so our, our testing is, is really fantastic and it's very, it's very unique. Uh, the usual testing is to have a nasal pharyngeal swab, which involves sticking something quite a long way up your nose further than you imagined it was possible to do. And, uh, and if you had to do that twice a week, you might be reticent to do that. But uh, our test is a saliva test. And what was clever about the way it was designed is that it cuts out some of the intermediate steps that other saliva tests have. And what that means is that we can do it quicker, we can do it cheaper, uh, we don't have uh, limitations due to supply chain. And so the test is very, uh, is, is very, is very easy to do in, in a sense once you know how to do it. But the other thing that's important about it is that we get the results back really fast. It's as accurate, if not more accurate, than the nasal pharyngeal test. And what that means is that if you don't have a delay in getting the results back, you can isolate exposed, sorry, isolate infected people much quicker and so cut down the chain of transmission. <clears throat> and that, that chain of transmission is what causes the, the disease to grow out of control. And so with, uh, with the uh, contact tracing from the uh, public health, uh, exposure notifications, uh, we, we can really have a good chance to slow down uh, the epidemic. And the fact that it's uh, unique is why there's been a huge amount of external interest in our SHIELD program. And, uh, and in fact, the governor has also announced uh, just th this week um, how he's looking into uh, uh, deploying some of the ingredients of our program uh, statewide. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely, yeah. Sergey, how do you decide which of those data points to include in your modeling? Thank you for this question. It's very important that we actually use all the data for modeling. So we are not really handpicking the, our models will not be very informative if we, we decide which data to, to fit. So every week when we construct a new iteration of the model, we have one week more uh, of data, but we do not exclude the old data. So we fit it from the start of the epidemic up to yesterday, basically. And uh, we also only use data on hospitalizations, ICU occupancy, and death. And that was a conscious choice because we felt that the data on number of positive cases is very much uh, influenced by test availability. So for instance, when this uh, fantastic, uh, now that the fantastic tests, uh, shield tests are available to our community, we have many more tests per capita than some neighboring counties. And how exactly to incorporate this information into a model is not at all straightforward. Whereas hospitalizations and ICU occupancy and deaths are sort of universal they unify different communities and they can be fit into universal models. So Robert, um, I, know, I know you're proud, I'm proud of all the work they're doing, but what are the actual benefits of having our own experts create the models for our university? Well, Robin, I can tell you that one of the most important benefits is the, is the fact that uh, one of the things that you enjoy as a leader of a world-class research university where interdisciplinarity is at the core of our mission and our values. Uh, it really is helpful, not only uh, in normal times, but I can tell you it's very critical in the middle of a pandemic because uh, uh, we literally have on this campus, uh, as we've seen demonstrated, uh, the expertise of two of our outstanding professors uh, who are outstanding scholars and who have really dedicated a lot of time to this effort and have shifted their scholarship from what they normally are studying uh, to try to make not only our possibility of reopening as a university possible, but as you can see, it's also been benefiting uh, helping our state leaders also make critical decisions that I believe has saved lives. So uh, this has given us the ability to adapt and to move forward. And these two individuals and their planning teams uh, aren't just external advisors, they are leaders in partnership and expert on our campus. And they are great partners with the expertise that we have uh, with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health Department of Waste and his team. And you couldn't ask for a better mix of experts 
to help us guide this university that is also helping the rest of the state and I think potentially the rest of the nation and the world as well. So couldn't be more excited, couldn't be more proud. Can, can, can you talk for just a minute about how the leadership team is using the models in actual decision-making? Uh, this, let me just put it simply. We would not be anywhere near with the comfort level of opening if it were not for this analysis that we've heard about today, including the testing and all of the other things that we've been talking about in these briefing sessions. So Nigel and Sergey, Sergey have been greatly involved in the SHIELD testing team, as well as the modeling. Their advice to the provost and myself has been critical in decision-making, has shaped and given us great confidence that we can return safely and uh, their data has really helped us make the decision that uh, I think a few universities are considering, and that is to uh, how we will start to continue to teach remotely after the fall break, uh, because their data clearly shows that it has put us in harm's way. If we allow students to go away for fall break and then come back, you're only increasing the possibility for additional spread of the disease. And so those are the fundamental ways that they have helped shape our decision. And I can tell you, I know speaking for Andreas, myself and the whole leadership team, we trust them and we listen to what they have to say. And I can tell you if there comes a scenario as they model where we have to pivot and make a different decision that's based on their data, I assure you the provost and our will be again listening and trusting their information and their data to help us make the right decisions regardless of what those decisions might be. And I think that gives us all a lot of peace. Thank you very much. Um, Nigel and Sergey, I was going to ask you this one, but I think I'm going to ask Awais instead. Awais, why is testing so important to maximizing all of our safety? Why is it not enough to just say everybody wear your face covering and stay six feet or more apart? Sure. So, you know, Nigel has covered this before as well, you know, that the faster we can test, the, the sooner we can identify individuals who are infected and isolate them. And then, uh, you know, with a robust contact tracing program, we can identify all the people who are close contacts. Now, the goal of public health is to break the chain of infection and to prevent clusters and outbreaks. And, and you know, th this can only be done if we can if we can have a good testing program, which is convenient, which is you know easy, and which can have results really soon, so and we have I think we have all of these things. Uh, it, it's it's a perfect you know it, it's a dream world for public health. We've never had something like this uh, ever. I mean I've been in public health almost 20 years. I've never seen something like this ever in my life, and I never thought I'll see something like this ever as well. So, so it is gonna be very important to have testing and to complement what the university has done for testing, we have hired contact tracers, case investigators, uh, you know, more than what the national recommended average is so that we can respond immediately. I mean, we'll have, we'll have shifts of employees working from about eight in the morning to about 10 at night to make sure that we, you know, we, we find out who those individuals are as soon as they test and put them in isolation so that we can, again, break that chain of infection and limit the clustering and the outbreaks of cases. And I think we are in a good position to do that. That's great, thank you. Um, and I think this one is for Sergey. Um, how can we use modeling to anticipate outbreaks, um, whether it's on campus or in the community and to guide the university? The chancellor said, you know, we, that's how we're gonna make decisions going forward. So, so talk about how, how that will work. Well, uh, there are a number of variables that uh, will be monitored, and uh, this is both at the university level or at county level and at the state level. And uh, some of those variables are already mentioned in my talk, like hospitalizations and uh, ICU room occupancy. Others involve uh, test positivity rate. Uh, we heard a lot about it on the news lately about how it is rising in the south of the state and it uh, still remains blissfully low, even though rising in the central areas of the state. So they need to be monitored and uh, it allows us to make predictions sort of 
several weeks in the future. Um, the models also allow you to, est one, to estimate a parameter R, this famous uh, uh, parameter, which now became a household name. This R has to be smaller than one in order for epidemics to go away. So we need to constantly monitor all of those variables. And again, speaking about our community, the very fact that we will have this uh, twice weekly testing of the university community will give us a very, very accurate data which will allow us to make really unprecedentedly accurate estimates of all of those parameters. And finally, we can really use different uh, mitigation strategies and compare them in our models to see, for instance, if one uh, targets specifically super spreading events, how much of an impact we will see in reduction, reducing the, uh, the spread of the epidemic. So again, the models can sort of play a scenario without actually going there. Great, thank you. And Nigel, I'm gonna give the last question to you. With all you've learned through your research and the modeling, what would you tell members of our campus community and the greater community about the importance of following the public health protocols? Um, well, I think <laughs> this is a really uh, a very simple message, which is that these, these protocols are designed to keep everybody safe. And, uh, and by following them, uh, we ensure that, we ensure that uh, our communities can reopen, uh, that our businesses can function, our, the ec economics of the state can uh, get going again. And uh, if we endanger them in a way that is, in a sense, you know, w willful and, and, uh, and you know, not, uh, not, not following uh, what, what is the public health advice, one is really putting all those things at risk. And as a way said, we would then be required by the governor probably to uh, go back to a previous stage. So you know, the message is th these things, if we do this right, if, if we limit spreading, we will be able to uh, act uh, in the ways that we are accustomed to doing. We'll be able to have some kind of new normal. We will be able to have economic activity and, and that will benefit uh, everybody. So I, I do hope that people uh, do listening to this uh, do see that this message clearly comes through, not just from uh, a, a, an opinion that people might express, but from hard data and mathematical uh, predictions that are, that are incontrovertible. Yeah, not knowing the duration of the pandemic, figuring out a way to be able to continue um, our activity uh, at a higher level than we would under a shelter in place is really critical, isn't it? Yes, exactly. We don't know how long it will be. And we, we took a hit with the first wave of the epidemic where we had a stay at home order and we should not squander uh, that, what that brought us. Which, and what it brought us in East Central Illinois is a remarkably low prevalence rate. And we want to keep it that way so that we can then proceed to start to reopen in a cautious and safe way. That's great, thank you. Chancellor Jones, would you have any final words for us today before we close? Just a few, Robin, and uh, just to simply say thank you to our experts, both from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and our very outstanding colleagues in Champaign-Urbana Public Health Department of Ways. Thank you for being with us. And most of all, thanks to all of the hundreds of you who have joined in, the, in this uh, briefing today. Uh, we certainly hope that you've learned something that uh, is going to benefit you and better understanding what we're trying to do, why we're doing it. And with that, have a wonderful day. We're so glad to have you participate in this briefing. Back to Robin. Thank you, sir. And again, thank you to Chancellor Jones. Thank you to Professors Goldenfeld and Maslow. Thank you to Dr. Vade. We really appreciate your, uh, your time and, and even more so your wisdom and your willingness to lead us through this. Thank you so much. Also wanna thank quickly my colleagues who helped make this happen. Allison Vance, Chris Harris, Brian Mertz, August Chess, Katie Watson and Leah Peck in public affairs and Brian Boyle, our technology service guru. Uh, as I said earlier, our next briefing in this series will be next week. It will be on what faculty and staff need to know to return to campus. So it'll be at the same link as today. And as always, all of these briefings are recorded, are closed captioned and are posted on the covid19.illinois.edu page. And we hope you can go there and visit at your leisure and uh, listen to anything again that you might've missed. I know this one had a lot of really, really uh, important information in it. So please do feel free to go check it out again. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day.